Song and Rainstorm, the story of musical prodigy Thomas Blind Tom Wiggins by Glenda Armand. Baby Tom was different. His mother Charity slowly shook her head as she cradled him in her arms. Mingo, his father, paced the dirt floor in silence. They knew what would be expected of their son when he grew up. The same that would be expected of any black baby born in 1849 on a Georgia plantation. Chop wood in the freezing cold, pick cotton in the scorching heat, obey or be punished with the whip, the auction block or worse. What would Master Jones do when he discovered baby Tom was blind? Mingo and Charity Wiggins did not have long to wait for an answer. Jones sold the whole family to a nearby farmer, General James Bethune. Jones included the baby free of charge. Charity held baby Tom close as she and her family bumped along in General Bethune's wagon to their new home. She knew her baby was not a useless burden as Master Jones had called him. But even Charity could not imagine that one day her son would be called a musical wonder. From birth, baby Tom's sense of hearing was remarkable. He giggled and cooed at the things he heard, his mother singing a crackling fire, pots and pans rattling. As baby grew, baby Tom delighted in creating his own noise. He pinched his sisters to hear them squeal. He climbed atop the table and shoved off dishes. Cling, clatter, clash. Baby Tom clapped with glee. Mingo built a wooden crate and put them in the middle of their cabin. Instead, his headstrong son could, inside, his headstrong son could sleep, play, and stay out of trouble. But sounds swirled around Baby Tom, beckoning him to follow. And he did. Out of the crate and out of the door. Day or night, rain or shine. One morning, the drip, drip, drip of a steady downpour drew baby Tom onto the porch. The rain's melody lured him too close to the edge. He fell head first into a bucket of water. His mother rescued him just in time. While Tom was undeterred, his family was worried. His siblings wondered why their little brother did not talk or behave. Charity explained that Tom was not misbehaving. He was different from other children. Charity gave Tom's sisters the task of fetching their brother when he wandered off. When his sisters, with his sisters in pursuit, little Tom continued his search for new sounds. He toddled to the fence surrounding the cabin. He climbed up, listened, and then echoed what he heard. He whinnied with the horse crowed with the rooster and hooted with the owl, all with perfect pitch. Soon the fence proved no match for Tom's curiosity. Distant voices led him to an open window of the big house. Inside, General Bethune's daughters had gathered to sing and play instruments. On this day, the sisters received a big surprise when they stopped singing. Their song continued without them. Four-year-old Tom became the eager student of a quartet of teachers. After just a few lessons, he could belt out every song the sisters knew. But as always, Tom was simply mimicking sounds. One evening after the children had sung for the family, General Bethune declared that if Tom could sing, he could speak. The general walked over to the little boy. Tom heard, sit down, Tom. At the same time, he felt himself being guided onto a chair. Then, as he was being lifted from the chair, Tom heard, stand up. Tom smiled. He understood. The sisters jumped into action. One by one, they handed Tom an object while pronouncing its name. Excitedly, Tom felt and smelled each object, repeating its name, and never forgot it. Little Tom continued to discover and learn. He was fascinated by the instrument Mary, the oldest sister, played. Touching, sniffling, sniffing, listening, Tom explored every inch of the huge object. 
He sat on the bench and found the keys. He banged on them with his hands and elbows. The girls covered their ears. What a cacophony. Tom kept playing, using only his fingers. As he struck the keys, he realized that each had its own voice. The cacophony transformed into a familiar melody. Seeing a business opportunity, General Bethune decided that Tom would live in the big house. Tearfully, Charity walked, to Tom, walked Tom to his new home. Her son was still enslaved, but at least for now, he would be safe. Still, she would miss him. And in her heart, Charity knew that Tom would never again live with his family. That day, Tom began his new life with his very own piano. Mary grounded him in the basics. He took lessons from tutors, then he soared on his own. Seated at the piano, Tom entered into his own world. In it, he spent up to 12 hours a day. When he was there, Tom was not different. He belonged. When Tom did stray from the piano, he frolicked outdoors. He moved with ease through scented flowers and trees. Oh, the joy of spinning, eyes closed and chin up, feeling the sun's warm embrace or the rain's soft kisses on his face. Nature spoke to him and he responded on the piano. What are you playing, Tom? Someone would ask. What the trees said to me, his answer might be, or it's what the birdies sang to me. During one fierce storm, Tom made his way back and forth between the piano and a tin roofed passageway. Rain danced on the roof. Tom's fingers danced on the keys. Plink, plink, plink. Lightning cracked and Tom thundered. Boom, boom, boom. A short time later, family, friends, and workers peered through the windows and doors and gathered in the parlor to listen to the six-year-old play his first composition, Rainstorm. To Tom's delight, everyone cheered and hooted and clapped. General Bethune announced that Tom would become a professional musician. Billed as Blind Tom, he performed in his home state of Georgia and throughout the South. Some people went to see Tom's show, doubting his ability. There must be trickery involved. After all, how could a blind, enslaved boy master the piano? But although Tom was unpredictable and might not stick to the program, his talent always shone through. He played requests and songs he had composed. He made his piano rat-a-tat-tat like a drum, chirp like a sparrow, and twang like a banjo. By the end of the show, doubters had become believers. News of the child prodigy reached Washington, D.C. in 1860. When Tom was 11 years old, he played for President James Buchanan. Tom was the first African-American artist to perform at the White House. Even as the Civil War raged, Southerners lined up at concert halls to pay 50 cents to attend Tom's performances. The audience challenge was a crowd favorite someone would come on stage and play a piece of music. Whether it was long or short, classical or created on the spot, Tom listened intently and then repeated the piece note for note. For his finale, Tom played one song with his left hand and another with his right, all while singing a third in perfect harmony. In 1865, the war ended and slavery was abolished. Although he was no longer enslaved, Tom's life continued much as before. For him, freedom meant creating music from the world from around him. With freedom, his world became bigger. Along with his tutor, assistant, and General Bethune, Tom traveled by rail across the United States and Canada. His love of trains had led Tom to create a special act for his show. He combined his words, chuck, chuck, chuck with his piano chords, clang, 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 clang. His impression was so realistic that in your mind's eye, you saw the train coming. Everywhere he performed, young Tom played classical pieces and popular ditties. He added new routines and kept cloud pleasers. Once in Alabama, an accomplished pianist played a piece for the audience challenge. Tom smiled and listened. 
When the pianist finished, Tom said, I'll play the number as the lady played it. After doing so, Tom announced, now I will play the number as the lady should have played it. And he did, hitting all the notes that the pianist had missed. Before long, Tom was an international celebrity. At 17, he set sail for Europe. General Bethune explained to Tom that commoners and royalty would come to see him with one question on their minds. Was this blind former slave truly the greatest living musician? Tom was eager to answer with his piano. He gave a flawless performance of a difficult piece, Beethoven's third piano concerto. The crowd shouted its approval, bravo, bravo. But Tom was not done. He had impressed them. Now he would transport them. Tom played the concerto again, this time with his back to the piano. Left hand playing the right hand part and vice versa. He did not miss a beat. And the final note, at the final note, people sat in stunned silence. Impossible yet they had witnessed it with their very own eyes and ears. Tom stood facing the audience. Finally, he heard the theater erupt into thunderous applause. Cheers rang out. Tom trembled at the sound. Tears streaming, he took a bow. This was his world, and he resigned. Tom's European tour was the highlight of a career that spanned half a century. Many thousands of people around the world attended his performances. How fortunate they were to experience the genius of Tom, Thomas Wiggins. To board Tom's piano train and joyfully ride along as Charity's son, the musical wonder, turned a rainstorm into a song. The end.